Good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, the University of Tasmania and the Australian Institute of International Affairs Island of Ideas online public lecture series. Um, it's a great partnership that we share between AIIA and the University of Tasmania. Firstly, as a reflection of both organisations' re recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania and AIIA wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Palawa people, and custodians of the land on which we meet or are broadcasting from. And we pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, I'm Kim Boyer. I'm lucky enough to be the Tasmanian president of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Before we start tonight's webinar, I just want to pay respect to our prior um, president of AIIA in Tasmania, Professor Peter Boyce, who resurrected the AIIA in this state from a very parlous position. Peter died at the weekend after a short illness. He's um, highly respected and loved both in Tasmania and in WA where he worked um, and um, we pay respect to him. Getting back to tonight's event, Island of Ideas began last year during COVID, interestingly, the topic of our conversation tonight, and it started to keep ideas flowing during a period when we were unable to host public events. The program's continuing in 2021 as a mixture of online and campus events with the, with the safety of our communities well and truly on our minds. Each year, the university presents hundreds of lectures, forums, seminars, and workshops to nurture ongoing learning of students, alumni, and the wider community. Uh, webinars have given us the chance to extend that to organizations like AIIA nationally and also to an international audience. These are important part, an important part of both of our reasons of existing. So before we start and before I introduce our speaker, Professor Sarah Davies, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Apologies if I refer to my notes. Firstly, your microphone, camera, chat function and raised hand functions have all been disabled so our speakers aren't interrupted. But we do encourage you to ask questions and you can do that at any time by typing them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions anonymously or with your name attached, whichever you prefer. And finally, this lecture is being recorded for later access on our YouTube and Sound, SoundCloud channels. Um, it couldn't be a more opportune time to talk about COVID-19 and um, Sarah's topic of locating cooperation in response to COVID-19. When we asked Sarah to do this lecture, I think it's fair to say that the Delta strain had not, at that stage, emerged in the world or in Australia. And so we were in a different space and we were looking forward. Um, I think that the topic, as Sarah says, is like shooting um, a moving bullet or shooting at a moving target because um, life is um, not the same and is not likely to be. We're really lucky to have Sarah with us. She's an international relations scholar with a specific focus on global health governance and women, peace and security. Sarah has been an Australian Research Council Discovery Australia postgrad um, fellow and scholar and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Those are both hard won awards. She's published three sole authored books on global and regional health issues and has co one co-authored on women, peace and security. We're lucky to have Sarah with us and thanks Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Kim, for such a generous introduction. I really appreciate your invitation to speak uh, to everyone tonight. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your encouragement actually for me to speak uh, in the Island of Ideas from last year. So thank you so much for your generosity. I'd also like to thank Belinda and Eden behind the scenes. I'm going to now share my screen. Uh, and I'd also like to, uh, first of all, just reassure everyone that my screen, Kim, could I just get a confirmation that my screen is showing? Just a thumbs up. 
great. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to make that little now. So I would like to acknowledge uh, also the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today. I'm in Mianjin and pay my respects to the Turrbal uh, people uh, and their elders past and present. And I extend my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nations people and recognise that these lands were always unceded, were never ceded. So tonight I'm going to be throwing a lot of slides at you <laughs> and I apologise for that in advance. They're quite heavy content. But one of the things that I'm trying to work through myself, and, and I really appreciate the chance to talk to you all tonight, is because what I'm trying to think through is the story of failure. And I do think we have to accept that 2020, in terms of the type of international cooperation that needed to be activated to try and confront the rise of the COVID-19 pandemic, faced immense challenges, uh, particularly around the area of faith in the reporting system, faith in the World Health Organization, as well as um, trust in, in, a, in a shared facility for vaccine production and access. And I do think 2020 had enormous challenges in this area, possibly failures. I think 2021 is also facing significant challenges. And the reason why I've switched from failures to challenges is because I do think that cooperation is still possible I think it's going to be very difficult and I outline where I think the difficulties are, but I have to be an optimist and I, and I have to believe that we can try and claim back the territory that was lost in the cooperation space in 2020. It's going to be more of an overview. I don't have a research question other than why is it a little cooperation and I, and I kind of give my thoughts on that. I don't have a data set to present, sorry, or anything like that. This is my observations, um, but I'll, I'll, I hope I can make them uh, entertaining for those of you and, and more than anything, just foster some questions. I'm really keen to hear your thoughts. So I put at the beginning here this quote from Dr. Chedros, uh, the Director General of the World Health Organization, who in July last year said, the greatest threat that we face now is not the virus itself, rather it's the lack of leadership and solidarity at the global and national levels. This is a tragedy that's forcing us to miss many of our friends and lose many lives. And we cannot defeat this pandemic as a divided world. And I think it's important to look at that quote a year on and think about whether or not we think we're still divided, whether or not we think there is enough leadership and solidarity at the moment to try and overcome the challenges that we still have before us. And I'm not going to go through all the data and statistics about COVID-19. I think most of you are quite familiar with those, other than to say that we're obviously still in a situation, as Kim said, where the Delta strain is putting immense pressure on countries in our second year of this pandemic. And I think it's, it's desirable to talk about recovery, but I think we all have to brace ourselves for another year, if not more, of this stop start, seeing recovery in the horizon, perhaps rather than right in front of us. And, and that's the that's the context in which I'm giving this talk tonight. So one of the things that I want to do is go back to the beginning. And I think it's important to go back to the beginning because I want to start with the timeline here. When we're talking about cooperation, we always assume, I think, that we're starting from a point at which the cooperation was always going to be fractured and difficult in this space because of where the virus occurred, you know, mainland China, and the sense of distrust that was in place already in terms of the types of international politics that had been occurring for a number of years, particularly on the UN Security Council around, you know, increasing sort of divisions and rifts that were starting to emerge amongst the permanent five there, and it was flowing into other parts of the United Nations. And the World Health Organization is one where it's been alleged that this was happening. If we look at this sequence of outbreak events that happened in January 2020, what we see here is, first of all, um, the, the, the narrative that the World Health Organization was reluctant or reticent for trying to balance diplomacy with China over diplomacy 
uh, or, or honest reporting to other countries. What we see here is that there needs to be maybe a little bit of a correction of this narrative. It's quite clear that the World Health Organization was seeking information from the Chinese authorities about the suspected virus. We know now that there is a possibility the virus was starting to take effect earlier than December, and there's still a lot of attempts to try and understand that backstory, and I'll come back to that later. But in terms of what the World Health Organization, the country office located in China was, was understanding, and then how it communicated with the headquarters in Geneva, what we see here is a, is a quite rapid attempt as soon as it came into their surveillance register that there was something happening here. There was a prompt attempt to try and ascertain the information in terms of what was happening, what was the Chinese authorities uh, witnessing, and to try and get some information about this. What we also see too, and it is important to state, is that while there is disgruntlement or concern about the fact that you had a, a four to five day gap there, it seems, in terms of China coming forward with the full details about what it was that was happening, what they were witnessing in terms of this virus. The genomic sequence was published uh, on the 5th of January. It was then verified and it then went through a series of sort of clearances to then be publicly released on 11th of January. And it was a sort of sequence of events over those 10 to 11 days that allowed the world then to be able to start activating systems of alert, to start noticing if there were any kind of individual arriving in country with this suspect pneumonia type symptoms to be not just isolated, but to then be tested. That genomic sequence that allowed the creation of the tests that we've been able to design to then establish whether or not an individual is uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2 and it's creating you know, the COVID-19 disease. So by the 14th of January, it meant that Thailand and Japan, for example, were able to detect and isolate their first cases of travelers who had arrived uh, in, in both instances uh, with, with COVID-19, with SARS-CoV-2. Now, where the concern and the sort of the um, disbelief comes in is the fact that it wasn't until the 20th of January then that China itself confirmed that what they were seeing here was a case of human-to-human -human transmission. So this was not just a, a random cluster where some event had happened where just a number of people had come into contact with an infected animal and this was what was causing the outbreak. This was actually a virus that was, you know, airborne and infecting. At the time it wasn't confirmed that it was airborne, but it was certainly confirmed at that point that it was human to human. But again, if we look at who Director General and what was happening during this period of time, we see that there was rapid release of information that they had to hand about what was happening. And there was also, by the early part of January, an attempt to try and bring together a committee that would be convened under the World Health um, International Health Regulations, which is sort of, if you like, a set of instructions for how the World Health Organization and state should respond to an emergency like this, a novel outbreak. The committee was convened. They decided on the 23rd, 22nd, 21st, 22nd of January that this was with China in the room, that this was needed to be more information. The belief is, is that the committee was divided on whether or not it should be declared a public health emergency of international concern. And with that comes a whole suite of recommendations about what states should do and what the World Health Organization should do. But Dr. Tedros insisted from the reports that, that they would meet in seven days time. And there was a lot of diplomatic effort put into those seven days of trying to make sure that that declaration on the 30th of January took place. Now, if we think about in terms of how does this performance sit against previous types of public health emergencies of international declarations, what we can see here 
is that we've been dealing with in terms of the number of times that the World Health Organization has had to manage these kinds of events. We're looking at not a high number, right? So we've got about nine to 10 where we've had situations where from H1N1, the influenza, which was the first time the World Health Organization convened this type of committee to try and declare these, through to numerous Ebola viral disease outbreaks that have occurred uh, mostly in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. In terms of the timeline that we're looking at for how long it takes for the World Health Organization to be able to get notice of an outbreak, confirm with the effect with the state in which that outbreak is occurring, you know, what's happening, and then try and convene a committee. We're usually looking at a big range here of time between one to two months, some cases up to six to 10 months it can take to be able to get that information and then to convene the committee and then for the committee to then to decide that what was being witnessed does warrant that declaration. And we've also had instances where the declaration hasn't been declared. So while it's fair to say here that, that the World Health Organization is heavily reliant upon states in which these outbreaks are occurring to kind of come to the party and to provide the information and agree to the process, it's also fair to say, I think, that this was a quite rapid set of decisions and responses and committee convening uh, in a situation where there was not a lot of information. If we want to point to flaws at this point in what's happened and how it's happened, I think it's really important, and people like um, the authors of this, of, of this article, Lucia Millen and others, have argued that we actually need to point to the problems with the way in which the World Health Organization has to depend upon states to consent to this type of process. They have to depend upon the information that they're receiving. And then there's a whole set of criteria applied to the public health emergencies of international concern that is not quite clear and consistent. There has been consistencies in its application in the past. So COVID-19 happened, if you like, out of this kind of Swiss cheese effect where we had been building over a number of years now this knowledge about the way public health emergencies were being convened were sometimes a little bit quixotic, not always consistent, and it tended to be heavily reliant upon whether or not states were happy with it to go down this path. It's also important to note, if we look at that graph that I've got on the uh, left-hand side for me, the coronavirus timeline, is that there was a rapid, there was, really was a massive difference uh, uptake in the release of information about the novel SARS-CoV-2 outbreak compared to the first SARS outbreak back in 2002, 2003. So again, while we can point to lots of flaws and lots of inconsistencies here, we also need to keep in mind, I think, and would argue strongly, that we have had, we really have had situations in the past where information took longer, confirmations took longer, and the disease spread at a much more um, global rate. So it was out and traveling before we had the tests and the types of measures that we were able to enact within that 30 days in response to COVID-19. So I've identified here a little bit, if you like, a, a question mark over this idea that the World Health Organization didn't act fast enough in January, but I've also identified as well that there were some previous rules set in place that states wanted to be there to, to make sure that who couldn't quite just jump the gun and, and make and put in force a whole lot of decisions that they didn't like that hampered perhaps the response and the full information that it could reveal at the time. But what we see by the 11th of March then is this immense pressure for the World Health Organization to declare COVID-19 a pandemic. And what's important to note here, and this will become important later on, there really isn't any type of regulation process in place for what qualifies the World Health Organization to declare an outbreak as a pandemic. There's this understanding that it's when a disease event has started to take place across the world and all parts of the world, and it's reaching a certain point at which that it's starting to increase in infection rates. But again, in terms of the criteria, how should that work? There's not a lot of clarity there. Um, and so it seems, again, that the World Health Organization 
declared this pandemic as a way to try and galvanize, if you like, states' responsiveness to the types of information that it was providing about the need for public health, distance, social distancing and control measures to be enacted. Uh, because by that point, it was becoming clear that the disease, that the virus was spreading rapidly around the world and a large number of states were taking very different measures and responses to how this virus was starting to affect them. And this was also, the, if you like, the, the indications that we started to have here that international cooperation in response to this outbreak was going to be very diff difficult. It was so novel that you had dissent and, and different views about whether it was airborne, whether or not masks needed to be worn, whether or not travel restrictions should be put in place or not. And again, I think we can look back now and see all, all of that with sort of the criticism of the value of hindsight. But at the time, there really was this sort of effort to try and understand what it was that we were dealing with here. And that created an environment of lots of inconsistency and lots of states using different levers and, and measures to try and contain it. And what I think is interesting is that the World Health Organization's advice was not at this point always being listened to. And there was often a sense that its advice was, was inconsistent because states were not responding to this virus consistently. There's an attempt on the 13th of March to activate a solidarity response fund by the World Health Organization. So at that point, they understood very clearly that this disease would require treatments, personal protective equipment, and a whole range of other types of basic sanitation supplies to be provided to low and middle income countries in particular to support their efforts to respond to this disease whilst they were also having to manage the other types of health emergencies that they were often having to deal with. And there was an awareness that restrictions would become a that restrictions, export controls and supply and demand would become a problem and the cost would become a problem. And indeed that did eventuate. The Solidarity Response Fund for the rest of the year was never able to raise the amount of income that it needed to be able to purchase the equipments that have been required around the world. And we're now adding on top of not just PPPE, we're also needing you know, clean disposable syringes, we're needing fridge supplies, we're needing a whole range of other types of supplies here in addition to the vaccines themselves. So the scale here is enormous. We had the UN General Assembly adopt a resolution of the global solidarity to fight COVID-19. But I also want you to note here, that those of you who are well acquainted with the United Nations, that the General Assembly is one state, one vote. And it's not, it's an important organ. It's really important to have that type of function, that legislative assembly there. But the one that can really put, if you like, international law into action is the UN Security Council. And it's not until the 1st of July, 2020, that we get any movement in that council on any type of recommendations around what states should be doing in response to COVID-19. And that is largely, it'd be nice if you all had had a global ceasefire, those of you who are fighting. So a fair amount of disappointment, I think it's fair to say, in these first six months in terms of how the United Nations institutions, particularly the strongest one, the UN Security Council, is responding to this crisis. On top of that, you've got a lot of activation, though, behind the scenes with the World Health Organization in cooperation with the European Commission, trying to launch this shared facility this what they called the tools accelerator of which COVAX, which you hear most about, was part of that forearm operation where it was about supplies, treatments, response and vaccines. And COVAX was meant to be this setup where it would be every country would buy into the scheme and the high level purchase from high income countries would then create the secure supply for pharmaceutical companies to produce a massive amounts of vaccines that could be supplied then across low, middle and high income countries. And it would be distributed on a priority basis of healthcare workers, most vulnerable, and then roll out to the rest of the populations. By this point, you also have the World Health Assembly starting to meet as it does every year in May 2020. And there's a lot of agitation by that point. Those of you who are following these details know. Do you know the United States, President Trump has made it very clear a previous month that he's not happy with the way the World Health Organization responded to COVID-19. 
19. And Australia and a number of other countries are also starting to show voice concern about the limits of the World Health Organization's response to these types of events and wanting an investigation in particular into the origins of SARS-CoV-2. There's this sense that China knew more than what they were willing to tell the international community. And the generous interpretation of that view was that the World Health Organization was hoodwinked or the worst interpretation is that they were somehow complicit in this conspiracy. And this was what this study of origins was all about trying to unravel. At the same time, you have the World Health Assembly agree to create an independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response led by former Liberian, Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, to look into what happened and what could be recommended in the future on the basis of at that point, them identifying that there is a serious cooperation failure occurring at the moment in response to COVID-19. I'm going to take a break and ask you to do a poll then to get your sentiments on what do you think at this point, not only about my narrative of those first six months, but in particular, what do you think about the uh, relationship between the World Health Organization and its response to COVID-19? And I'm genuinely interested to hear your sentiment on this question. So did the World Health Organization fail in its first response to outbreak of COVID-19? Thinking back to that January period and you can answer yes, no, or unsure if you, unsure can also be code for don't really care. Ah, so that's really interesting. So we're looking at about, yes, 43% in terms of failure, 29% for no, and 29% for unsure. Those of you who answered in this, I'd be really keen in the yes camp for you to please put forward your uh, your views. We're not looking at a big, if we look at the raw numbers here, we're seeing a difference of between 12 and eight, but still I'd be really keen to hear uh, your thoughts on that. So thank you, look forward to your questions. So the summary of the first six months is that we're seeing minimal cooperation. We're seeing some innovation here. We're seeing attempts, particularly I would say that the ACT Accelerator for all of the failures that it has had since. I think it's really important to note that in that first six months, when we're having this conversation about the World Health Organization as a, as a failed actor, we're having this minimal cooperation between states, they're all doing different things at this point. There is an attempt by a select number to try and think about a pooled in initiative where you would try and create design, uh, testing, access to the equipment, treatments and vaccines uh, that would be everyone would sort of have the chance to buy into. It was, I think, for all of its flaws, a really innovative attempt. And as a global health scholar, I will say it was not something that had really been thought about or put on the cards uh, before COVID-19. However, in the next six months of 2020, what we start to see here is a lot of buy-in to COVAX, a real rush by a number of low and middle income countries to be part of it. But we're also seeing a real difficulty with being able to get some of our core states, the states who are designing, investing in and producing the vaccines. The US, Team European Union, United Kingdom, Russia and China are very reluctant to come into COVAX. And COVAX has a, you know, a mandate where it was trying to achieve a particular sign up by September 2020, because this is all about investment in COVAX to then secure with the pharmaceutical groups, the purchasing of the vaccine. So this is all about the steps that need to be put in place to be able to arrange the contracts, to be able to guarantee payments, to be able to uh, have a distribution route in place, because some of these vaccines we already knew at this point were going to be very difficult to deliver in different environments, depending on their health systems, their urban rural, loca urban rural locations, and their access of trained individuals who could deliver the vaccine. So this was and civic registration systems required. 
So this was a massive undertaking. So there was a desire to get this done as soon as we could. And it was very difficult to get some of the core states who were going to be, in some cases, pushing forward for the pharmaceutical companies located in their countries to participate in the COVAX scheme. So again, these continued little hurdles are starting to appear, even in these small instances of innovation. We also see a real sudden shift from lower middle income countries in October when governments of India and South Africa supporting COVAX put forward the argument that when it was becoming clearer and clearer that those countries that had majority of pharmaceutical supply manufacturing were not going to be taking COVAX, that there was a certain degree of unfairness here. And in particular, that there was a high degree of risk to these countries relying on a system through COVAX where they don't have the same amount of economic and, and political power in these relationships and they're heavily reliant upon a vaccine scheme that's never going to allow them necessarily to produce the vaccines and to be able to guarantee their own supply of vaccines. And by this point, it was becoming quite clear that the vaccines for COVID-19 were not going to be a one-off condition, there was going to be the need to perhaps regenerate supply on an annual buy, you know, at least on an annual basis. And so they argued very strongly that there needed to be a waiver, that this constituted an emergency. And that was the grounds for the intellectual property rights around the vaccines to be waived. And that all treatments, including the vaccines, should be not held under intellectual property laws, and they should be distributed so that anyone can manufacture. And of course, as most of you know, at this point, the European Union, the United Kingdom and the United States rejected uh, this, this waiver. And they're very powerful in terms of the way the World Trade Organization is set up for in terms of who is able to block these types of waiver petitions. And that waiver is still ongoing, that request is still ongoing today and hasn't been resolved. China joins COVAX in 2020, and COVAX then reaches the $2 billion investment target to secure purchases. So again, we've got this flip side too, where we've got major donors in COVAX, Japan, Team Europe, the United States, the United Kingdom, are also though, ironically, are the ones who are not necessarily facilitating, if you like, that kind of ease of supply. At the same time that COVAX is being designed, a lot of these countries are organising their own country supply deals, ensuring that there are expert export cutoffs where the supply of vaccine needs to be delivered in their own home country before it can go elsewhere. And at the same point, we were dealing with a situation where the two billion investment needed to secure the doses was not going to necessarily secure the actual volume of doses that the COVAX needed to even meet its 10% figure. So we're having a real battle here by the end of this year of 2020 in terms of the type of supply needed, countries starting to really understand the full extent to which they were going to be dependent on pharmaceuticals being able to manufacture at the capacity required, and populations in countries getting tired and seeing their numbers of COVID cases rising and demanding of their governments that they meet their needs first. So there's an immense pressure under the international system in December 2020 and January 2021, where populations, particularly in the countries that were being relied upon for the donation of the vaccines, are also resisting the idea that there should be this distribution of those priority groups around the world ahead of them. There's also a tension here as well around the supply of the intellectual property. Trust at this point is just not there. There's this massive concern, right, from the pharmaceutical companies as well as from the countries with whom they've invested in these pharmaceutical companies that they do not want to be supplying this real supreme intelligence to countries where they cannot control then the production and the supply. So at this point, we have a situation where a vaccine solution has appeared. We're really close now. Pfizer gets its first emergency use listing covered by the World Health Organization. 
But the but the tensions for states is do they cooperate? and wait their turn and trust that this is how it's going to work and trust that their populations to wait their turn? Or do they start to pursue the bilateral deals that they need to get their economies going and invest then only in their friends? And from China to the United States, everyone and in between, this is the second they start to pursue. They're going to do their own deals. They're going to get their own vaccines going for their homeland populations. And then there'll be these very discreet investments. And it's fair to say that China and Russia at this point was going much faster with the investment in friends strategy than what the European and United States countries were. So we're getting these two speeds, three speeds start to emerge by the end of 2020. And terms like vaccine diplomacy start to emerge. We've also got COVAX at this point now, this great initiative being stuck because it cannot, it's always coming second, third in line in terms of being able to get access to the vaccine production. And on top of that, SARS-CoV-2 strain has now started to develop different strains and that's increasing the sense of panic. We also have this sentiment now that the, what the world needs to correct the past that the World Health Organization took is to create a pandemic treaty. And that starts to again emerge from the European Union, that this is what's required to organise future outbreak response. But we see very little interest in this recommendation. Unlike COVAX, we see the United States, the United Kingdom, even Australia, not particularly interested in this petition for a pandemic treaty. And we're also seeing the World Health Organization now at this point, quite, I think, concerned about the way in which its reputation has been heavily tarnished by this virus, and now seeking quite persistently under the World Health Assembly resolution in May to send an independent panel into China to investigate the origins of SARS-CoV-2. And China is resisting to some extent the whole way on the terms of what can be investigated in that panel. So now I'm gonna take a break and let you do your next poll. Has the international distribution of COVID-19 vaccines been fair or unfair? Been unfair, sorry, been unfair. Yes or no and unsure. It's really interesting in these results, actually, 23% unsure, um, because uh, those of you who, who, um, were not, who were not particularly fussed with the World Health Organization's response, that 43%, uh, I'd really be keen to see how you voted then along the lines of this vaccine one, because that certainly has been the sentiment of the World Health Organization, that the, that the pursuit has not only been unfair, it's been actually quite dangerous. And it's part of the reason why we're having the difficulties with the strains that we have today. So this is a yucky slide, isn't it? There's way too much going on here. What I'm gonna do here very quickly, because I know that I'm running out of time, is just take you through the fact that what we're starting to see at this point, the challenges are deepening, okay? So we have, but at the same time, opportunities are emerging. So we've got, Bilateral deals, as I said before, are happening, but China then vaccine makers apply to join COVAX. This ends up being crucial, by the way, because of then what happens in March. The United States, we've got a new administration in. They've joined COVAX. Not only have they joined COVAX, they're starting to support now again the World Health Organization. We're seeing the United Nations adopt a second resolution, this time calling for a ceasefire end for vaccine sharing. We see COVAX by March starting to supply some of the vaccines. We're also starting to see some regional shifts here. We're seeing United States, Japan, India, and Australia start to, if you like, for want of a better word, step up and realize that the last six months of 2020, Russia and China has made a lot of deals and a lot of moves with about over 90 countries in vaccine production and supply. China is also starting to sign in agreements with countries about vaccine production from Egypt to Indonesia. So at this point, you're starting to see this recognition that there's a need to really accelerate the, the different types of cooperation that need to be in action here. 
India signs on to an important deal to produce 1.1 billion vaccines. When I say this, look, our numbers are still not where they need to be, right? We're needing well in advance of about 11 billion to 12 billion vaccines here. But this is the conversation that's happening. And then Delta comes. India has to halt the export or chooses to halt the export of its vaccine production to deal with the domestic scale of its COVID emergency. Dr. Tedros at this point in May says that if we're not reaching a 10% vaccine, fully vaccinated population across each country, we're going to have more and more strains emerge and in particular healthcare systems are gonna come under massive pressure because healthcare workers will be those infected. And indeed that's what we saw with India and that's what we've seen tragically with Indonesia. So it has that massive effect then on the systems and starts to ripple across into other complications for the health system recovery. At the same time, we have the release of that panel report by uh, Clark and Salif. And what they recommend here, again, is the pandemic treaty and the creation of the Global Health Threats Council, which I'll come to later. At that World Assembly meeting, you do get some agreement that maybe we should ha keep having a conversation about the preparedness and response of WHO. And then in G7 in June, we have a conversation around the vaccine pledge, 1 billion vaccines in addition to the pledges to COVID, to COVAX, a review mechanism for IHR compliance, and the creation of a global pandemic radar, which is meant to be sort of, if you like, ahead of the game of any states that try and avoid their reporting obligations. So at the point here where we're standing is the challenges from 2020 are still there, right? So we don't have an agreement on a TRIPS waiver. The US state crucially has given support for this, but some of the other key actors required to support this waiver are not budging and nor crucially are pharmaceutical companies. And we cannot really advance this waiver too much if we don't get pharmaceutical companies on board. And there's a lot of conversation about they're kind of the gap in this international cooperation chain at the moment. We're about 10 billion doses short. And we're also starting to talk about the creation of new mechanisms when it to me seems quite clear that there's not a particular lot of support and enthusiasm for either the pandemic treaty or this Global Health Threats Council. And there's a lot of uncertainty as to why we're not trying to improve the international health regulations and actually think about what responsibilities the General Assembly and the UN Security Council should be doing here. I might skip this poll if that's okay, if you don't mind, and I'll get on to the so what challenges, if that's all right. So I think what we're looking at now for me in 21, 22 are four issues. The role of the World Health Organization and how much strength we want to see it have, qualified by the fact that any strength of that treaty depends upon state support. We are still dealing with a serious challenge to vaccines. We have a serious problem, I think, on the horizon with financing. And we've also got a serious problem here with faith and trust in human rights. So first of all, the pandemic treaty. We've got a problem here where there's really no consistency in terms of what we think this treaty should focus on. Is this about making the World Health Organization stronger? Is this about responding to future pandemics? And they're not going to be like COVID-19. That was the mistake we made with IHR, where we kind of designed the treaty, we designed the regulations in response to the crisis that we just had. And if we're thinking about early detection and prevention, we're still back to a problem where we can only know what states want us to know. And I think that's why we're seeing at the moment not a lot of support for this treaty. And it will be very interesting in November to see where the conversations go in Geneva when they meet to discuss this. Second, we're in a serious problem with vaccines, not just because of the inequality, but because there's a real pushback from lower middle income countries that vaccines for most of them mean more debt. This is the way it's going. COVAX is not able to meet the supply. So countries are going to have to go into debt to be able to purchase the additional vaccines that they need. And there's also a lot of heavy reliance in particular countries such as China and Russia to meet up or to tally up with the export production drop that India has had because of its delta. This actually points to a bigger problem here where we have not been diversifying production and supply of research and technology and health enough across the globe. It really has been, if you like, um, a north-south divide that has been inequitable and COVID now is our consequences of this. 
And it's not just in vaccines, it's also across a range of other equipments that have been required during this crisis that have massively gone up in price. And again, if we're looking at this vaccine, this virus for some time to come, we've got big challenges here in terms of how much debt countries are going to go into to respond to this virus. We've also got massive challenges as well in terms of dealing with the humanitarian crises that we already have and the serious risk of natural disasters emerging from climate change and food insecurity and the fact that not all vaccines are equal. So we're going to have two, three tiered economies here running at the same time with high degrees of grievance and high degrees of debt. And I really do worry about how that's going to impact on faith in international cooperation. And then finally, we have a problem here with the story of the United Nations and human rights and the idea that everyone is equal and that there is this universal declaration of human rights to which all individuals have the same rights and opportunities. And what we've seen here clearly is that that's not the case. And so, again, I worry the consequence of this then in terms of faith and the types of institutions that we've designed to try and reassure uh, populations and to address these inequalities. And how is that going to impact on faith in these systems and in these institutions? There's a lot of work here to be done and a lot of repair. So in terms of what next, I think we're dealing with a situation in our own region where we're seeing this kind of different, different levels occurring, where you've got great powers are trying to use smart power to keep friends and influence them. But that requires though a high degree of investment in those particular friends and making sure that they'll stay your friend into the next crisis. And I think it also, if you like, undermines the notion that we're all in this together and that we're all seeking to cooperate our way out of it. Investments in diplomacy are becoming more boutique and specialised, and I think that's going to compromise the type of international cooperation that we need to see to really get ourselves out of this crisis, because we've got a situation where different economies are running at different speeds, depending on the vaccines that they've got. We're going to have more, uh, more crises, I think, on the horizon. So I think at the moment it's fair to say that we're in a situation where international cooperation has been quite fractured by this. But there is the potential here. There are some good innovations here. I think the IHR, the TRIPS waiver, the COVAX, these are good attempts. There needs to be, though, a fair amount of trust and investment placed into these to try and help get them to lift up to meet this, the challenges that we have. And so I want to quote here with one of my uh, favourite historians, Margaret Macmillan who talked about it recently in an article in Foreign Affairs that we must not always think we need to challenge ourselves that passes prologue and to think about the fact that it is possible to, to pursue a different path here, but it takes wise, wisdom and bravery to get through the storm. Thank you, everyone. I went well over time. Sorry, Kim, um, but I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Sarah. There are a number of questions. Um, following on from that extremely um, succinct and sobering um, summary. So thank you, mate. So the first one, I'll launch straight into it. Um, Sarah, many thanks for your observations and assessments. I sit in the camp that WHO failed early on for the notification and declaration, but don't doubt that the public health bureaucratic challenges were tested in a dynamic geopolitical environment, particularly the US-China dynamics at the time. Given the lengthy experience of, of WHO, was there not opportunity to be more transparent about early warnings and indicators, even with limited information? That's an excellent question. Thank you for that. I think it's revealing that the international panel led by Sir Leif and Clark have requested now that the United Nations seriously engage in reform of the way its senior leadership is organised and that anyone in charge of an office agency or organisation should only have one term for seven years. There's not been a lot said about that, but I think that's quite a revealing recommendation that they've made, where they clearly felt that Dr Tedros, intentionally or not, was trying to tread with caution because of this job security and because of the knowledge that he's got to keep this job going longer. And, and that's one that all United Nations senior officials often uh, have. Um, and it's a problem about thinking about your election next time. And it's been often said that Gro Harlem Brundtland in response to SARS, COVID, SARS in 2003 threw all caution to the winds and listed China quite strongly as not complying because she wasn't going for another term. 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to combine two questions which are sort of about the trustworthiness of WHO. Like, can how can WHO be a trusted advisor and and um, do whether it's politicising its past, but especially right at the top of the organisation? And secondly, um, similar sort of question, what can be done to improve WHO as an organisation to work more efficiently and bring wealthy countries to work with a global perspective and coordinate their efforts in parallel with WHO? What needs to be done to keep politics aside and keep the global good? So a sort of um, combination of those mm. two questions. Thank you. So there's been an endless discussion about the World Health Organization and how to reform it. Uh, it's a technical organisation, so it's designed to give advice on health matters, but of course nothing in the international sphere is not political uh, and it's, it's subject to politics like anywhere else. And I think what it's trying to do at the moment and has been trying to do for the last 20 years is try and assist states in responding to these rise of health emergencies that are spreading across the world very rapidly due to the way that we live. And they're trying to issue this advice whilst also trying to get states to give them the information that they need to give the advice. Uh, and states don't always want to give that information. Um, and so the World Health Organization could make the choice to start just saying, this is what we're hearing. These are the rumors. Uh, and, and just bear the consequences of states being very quite angry with them. Or to tread with caution and try and get states to cooperate with them. And that tipping point is really hard to navigate. Uh, and I think it's hard to navigate because there, there are travel, there are economic consequences of who gets it wrong. Not just economic consequences for its own funding, there's economic consequences for the country if they get it wrong. If they declare something that's happened and then it turns out it's not, uh, they could devastate economies overnight, you know. Um, so it's, it's a fine balance here for them. Uh, it really does push forward the notion that states have to cooperate in this and who can only be as successful as the states want it to be. It's, it's said often, but that is true. But the other argument is, is that the World Health Organization could be doing much more to make much more engagement in those international health regulations. And for me, this is the disappointing outcome at the moment is this focus and obsession with a new treaty. When I actually think we've got a very good international health regulation instrument there that we should be trying to perfect, improve, prune, adjust. Let's, let's work with what we've got rather than try and create something new. Thank you. Um, there have been a couple of questions which basically say thank you, Sarah. So thank you, Sarah. Um, a question that's more close to home from John Hayton. Um, do you have any sense that the Australian government might think it should take a greater level of responsibility for the health of Pacific nations in vaccine production and supply and um, PPE supply? So the Australian government through the Regional Health Security Centre has been quite proactive in this space and has been really trying to uptick its investment in vaccines and vaccine supply across the Pacific. It's still not at the numbers, of course, that are required to see the whole population is fully vaccinated. And I think the Australian government has been trying to manage this difficulty with its own supply, with what it can then supply elsewhere. Um, it is interesting to me, though, that the Australian government is one of those where I'd say it's undertaking a very type of boutique diplomacy, where it's making it very clear that it's going to invest in particular countries and in particular initiatives. It is supplying funds to COVAX, uh, but it certainly is also supplying the majority of its funding and diplomacy as well into the region. I think what's really interesting will be to watch how Australia goes with this waiver agreement what is going to be Australia's position on the vaccine waiver and what is going to be Australia's position on supporting low and middle income countries with being able to develop their own systems of production, testing and um, response. It's interesting to me in the last week or so, I've seen that there's an uptick in investments in testing and laboratories by the Australian government in the Pacific. And I think that's a really important move. Uh, there really needs to be investment in capacity, uh, not, just, not, not only uh, in supply. Okay, one, um, I think we've probably got time for one more question, maybe two. Um, so thanks for your presentation, but considering the disproportionate impacts COVID-19 has had on women, do you think promoting women empowerment programs will help solidarity in repairing national economies? So I think one of the things that have been really sad about the COVID-19 recovery up to this point, if we look at the United Nations data on budget recovery um, plans, is that investments in 
gender sensitive and gender empowerment programs have been in the minority, not in the majority. And uh, the person who asked that question is absolutely correct that if we look at the 2030 SDG targets, the populations that are going to be most impacted in terms of extreme poverty, food insecurity, health harms, uh, is going to be primarily uh, women. But more than that, what we've also seen in this outbreak has been uh, young girls are less likely to be able to return to school. And we know that education is a massive importance in terms of being able to empower populations and to be able to change traditional norms and stereotypes in societies. So I think um, it's always it's this pressure again, right? Limited aid budgets uh, and where should they go? But I also think as well, there is again, a need for all governments to be thinking about gender inclusive recovery. Uh, there's a lot of desire to sort of build things and construct things and those things matter. Uh, but it's also really important to see populations, young populations get access to opportunity as well. That's an investment. One quick last one. Is there an ideal strategy that Australia or other states could adopt to combat new variants of COVID-19 quick enough rather than being consumed by one crisis following another? So the, the quick answer to that, that it seems to be the consensus is, is that if you can get the majority of healthcare workers and high risk populations vaccinated across the world, so that 10% 10, 10 target, and then there was also that 20% of the population across the rest across the world vaccinated, you would start to address the risk of the virus being able to circulate in particularly um, particular populations and particular healthcare facilities and clinics to the extent that it would then develop new strains. The problem with that has been, of course, that vaccine supply is one of the problems, but also being able to secure the logistics chain for the delivery of vaccine, for the actual injection in the arm, um, and overcome vaccine hesitancy as well, which we haven't talked about, which is a really serious concern across the world due to the way information now travels. Um, this has been a big problem as well for, for allowing the strains to grow and proliferate as they have, and sadly, worryingly, as they might do into the future. Sarah, thank you. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm sure that people would join me virtually in um, applauding um, for something that has been, um, which probably we all felt we knew lots about, but for me, it's been a really sobering and succinct summary of a lot of issues that I wasn't aware of that you've put together beautifully. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you everyone for being so generous with allowing me to talk more than answer your questions. I really do encourage you to send me an email if you if you feel I didn't cover something that you want me to cover. And thank you again for the time. Thanks, Sarah. And if you enjoy this, Sarah is also a member of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And here is more stuff that's coming up on the island of ideas, including um, an, further joint programs with the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Thank you. And good evening. <laughs>